hold hands and close your eyes. It's half past midnight, and you're listening to the Ghost Story Pass. Welcome to the Ghost Story Guys. I'm Brennan Storr. I'm Paul Bestel. This is the show where we talk about spooks, specters, and all the other things watching us from the shadows beyond the campfire. Some conversations only make sense after the sun has set, and this is most definitely one. Thanks for tuning in. This is episode number 197, and we're coming to you from that tiny mountain cabin you dream about, but can never quite reach. Paul, my friend, how are you doing? I'm always all right when it's happy Flatwoods Monster Anniversary Day, Brennan. So happy Flatwoods Monster Day. And happy Flatwoods Monster Day to you, my friend. How far, how far back? <laughs> so it was 70 odd years ago, I think. 70, 72 years young, the Flatwood Monster. I think it is. I might be getting confused with uh, the release of West You Were Here. Wish You Were Here. A natural mistake to make. <laughs> Two amazing things that happened on September the 12th. Yes, I think it was early 50s, so it's 70 years-ish since Flatwood Monster. Braxy turned up terrifying kids and frightening car drivers and emitting strange gases that made people feel ill. Paul, am I the Flatwoods Monster? <laughs> I don't know. Do you do you levitate and emit green light from your ass? Okay, no, no, that's uh, we're, we're I am firmly fixed to the ground, and uh, I am uh, I'm not going to pursue that line of inquiry any further. But yes, <laughs> not only is it Flatwoods Monster Day, we have a very special episode. We have a show about the haunting of Serbia, and th- we're doing this. We were going to do Prisons Part Two, uh, but we have pushed that back a couple episodes because we have theoretically we won't say who just in case it doesn't come together, but. We're expecting guests on next week's Talk Spooky who uh, recently were working in Serbia. And so I thought it would be fun to preface that, sort of lead into that with a look at the haunting of Serbia. Although I got to say, Paul, I was aware that the Balkans had a complex history. Uh, I was not quite aware of how complex or how challenging I've read about a third of Robert Kaplan's Balkan Ghosts uh, in, an inti- in anticipation of this. It's an older book, but it's, you know, the, it's a travelogue of the region from the late 80s and early 90s. And there was an atrocity described there that was so upsetting, I had to put the book down and just kind of walk away from it for a little bit. Mm. And uh, I said to you, I said, presumably you know enough about this to keep us out of trouble. And you go, yeah, don't, I can keep us out of trouble. Don't worry too much about it. So I have a baseline understanding of, of the region. Uh, but folks, if we do step on some toes, if, if you are from Serbia, if you're of Serbian ancestry, and we say something that is stupid, uh, hold a little grace in your heart for, uh, for uncles Bren and Paul, because we're going to do our best to navigate the thorny situation that is Serbia's history. But uh, you never know. Yes, especially as we got involved in the uh, war in the 90s up to our necks. Yeah, yeah, that's it. In Balkan Ghosts, there's an interview he does with a nun at the, I think it's a Gretznitsa Chapel. And she's, he just, she describes her as like a very intelligent, very passionate person. And then she just starts talking mad shit about Albanians. Hmm. And it is unhinged. You know, it's the same kind of like crazy rhetoric you hear from hate groups now. And, uh, you know, I, I know Albanians. It, the, the, it's not, this is not an accurate description of that people, yep. but it just was, and it was completely accepted. And there was so much of that, so many cult, deep cultural divisions yep. that I was completely ignorant of. Well, it's it's one of those things. It was a it was a long hangover from the Second World War, really, um, especially as Tito was on um, Hitler's side, um, and so it was one of the areas of Europe that nobody expected to collapse after the end of the Soviet Union. Um, But obviously Yugoslavia, as it was, collapsed fairly peacefully at the beginning. And then within two years, all hell broke loose everywhere. And it was just, it was, it was difficult to see because we were one of the few countries that sort of jumped in with both feet and very narrowly avoided starting World War Three. Oh, strangely, it uh, it also was responsible for uh, the singer James Blunt's musical career. 
because James Blunt was a very high ranking military officer uh, and he was involved in the skirmish that almost started World War Three because he refused to order his men to attack an air base that had been taken by the Russians. I had no idea. Yeah. I mean, I've seen a lot, obviously, because there's a lot of things about that area because of the football and because of the, where it was and the and the historic issues of it. And obviously growing up, I had friends who were originally Serbian refugees who came here after the Second World War. So we had a lot of... Uh, a lot of displaced people from that particular area who got out whilst they could. So it's 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 very interesting looking back that it, it's one of those things that I think people often talk about conflicts and they think about ethnic cleansing and, and stuff like that as though these are situations that have occurred centuries ago. And, and you know, we're talking 25, 26 years ago on our doorstep. It is a, a horrific history. And folks, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this in the show itself, but covering the stories of a place like Serbia. I mean, if you Google, like I did when I was starting the show, Ghosts of Serbia, man, you find some stuff. And so it's important that we mention this stuff at the top so you understand a little bit about the background. But again, we're not going to be dwelling on these things uh, within the show. So you, you don't have to worry as much about it. It's going to come up again. When you're covering a country like this, you, you can't, it can't not. But we will do our best to keep it light. But before we can do any of that... We gotta thank our patrons. This one's for the patrons. Patrons, we could not do what we do without you. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. For real, guys, every single person who downloads a ghost story, guys, you help make us who we are. But patrons, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube subscribers, you folks are how we can keep doing this. And while we'd like to thank every single one of you, right now we'd like to thank our newest subscribers. They are Charles Pratt, Sarah Kelly Cole, Veronica Rayner, Andrew Mains, Gabrielle Hollanders, PJM Marks, Goblin. I hope Goblin is the 1970s band. That's who I'm hoping. <laughs> Claudia Simonetti, we see you there. Oddly, I was listening to some of that the other day. Oh, no good. Some Goblin. I forgot which genre it's from. But anyway, I was on Goblin. There was some Goblin music playing. Can't go wrong with Goblin, man. I, I, was, I think I mentioned it the other day, I watched uh, one of those uh, Forgotten Jolly box sets from Vinegar Syndrome and they had a film with music from Claudio Simonetti in there it was really good thank you very much thank you in fact to all our new and existing patrons thanks to everyone who's ever signed up for Patreon or YouTube or Apple Podcasts again you are truly the heroes of this show you make it all possible and while we'll wait till the end of the show to tell you about all the cool things you get we will say for a dollar a month you get an ad free feed over on Patreon and you can sign up for that by clicking the link in our show notes or by heading to patreon.com slash ghoststoryguys, or signing up to Ghost Story Guys Premium via Apple Podcasts or YouTube. All right, we are going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back with The Haunting of Serbia. Divination. When I was little, in the 1980s, my two sisters and I went to Kuzmin to stay with my aunt, who was in the process of building a new house. We stayed in the old house, playing like kids do, but after a while we got bored and decided to mess around with the occult. We wanted to see if we could invoke spirits. Together, the three of us went to the new house, which was still under construction at the time, entered what was going to be the living room, set up a homemade divination board with the alphabet written on it, lit a candle, and invoked our grandfather. My aunt had let us borrow her portable tape recorder so we could listen to music while we played. Before we started playing at divination, we put the recorder on top of a tool bench so we wouldn't forget it when we left. At one point during the divination, the recorder turned on by itself. That alone wouldn't be too bad, but at the same time, tools in the toolbox started to shake against each other, and the cupboard doors in the kitchen began to open and close by themselves. We panicked and tried to leave, but couldn't open the door. One of my sisters suddenly had an idea and ran over to the candle. The moment she extinguished it, the recorder turned off, the cupboard door stayed shut, and we could open the front door. We went outside and never talked about it with our parents, or with each other, as if we wanted to forget it. Now I'm an old man, and I wonder if I imagined it all as a child or if it really happened, because that's the only proof I have that the paranormal exists. And we have a bonus story 
that's going to go. We actually have a couple bonus stories with this show because a number of the stories are quite short. Uh, but before we go to that one, Paul, I was going to say one of the things I was really interested in seeing when we did this, and I think this is a great example already, is how the word Ouija never once comes up. You know, that's obviously a, maybe a more Western way of referring to it, but obviously the, in Serbian, it's not a thing. And in actual fact, the, a lot of these stories had to really be cleaned up um, just because the translation, even the ones that weren't Google translated, the ones that were just, you know, sort of uh, Serbians uh, telling their stories, a lot of the, there were cultural references that were just like, I guess, colloquialisms that probably mm-hmm. make sense in Serbian, but I had absolutely no fucking idea what they were talking about. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, Ouija is more of a Western European turn of phrase. And um, people forget that Europe's only recently come together in the last sort of 30 or 40 years. So 150, 160 years ago, when spiritualism exploded across the West, some would perhaps say that Eastern European traditions were still alive and well, far more than they were in the Western side of Europe. And so for them, they didn't need terms like Ouija and spiritualism, because as far as they were concerned, they they never stopped practicing the old ways. Interesting. Now, there was something they they mentioned that Kaplan mentioned in Balkan Ghosts is they have a very different view of history. There, they almost have like a, a I, I don't totally understand what he's what he's saying, but it's like a more cyclical view of history. Yes. And so that there is a much greater connection to mysticism uh, as sort of as as part of that, which I was not aware of. Yeah, it's, it's it's essentially there. There is this belief in certain areas that conflict and change is a never-ending cycle in that particular part of the world, and for them, things always happen every so often. Right, right, right. The, the time is a flat circle. Yeah, because I mean, there's there's been some pretty heavy conflicts gone there. Not even in you know, you think of the modern era with World War One, World War Two, um, and then the Balkan conflict. But obviously, even before that, you've got the Napoleonic Wars that spanned all of Europe. You've got the Russian Revolution and the fallout of that. You've got the encroachment of Russia into that side of Europe and all the way down as well. You've got, you know, going back to the Romans and Greek conquests, Alexander the Great. So all that. The Turks also held the area for a period. I I know, at least in Macedonia, because I I was reading again in Balkan Ghosts, there's some horrific shit they were talking about during the, uh, the occupation of Macedonia. And uh, again, I, I had to put the book down, take a little walk. <laughs> well, obviously, Macedonia is one of those places that everybody forgets. It's the birthplace of Alexander the Great. That's where he came from. Right, right, right. Yeah, he was saying that in the book. He said, because every country in that region has at one point, they all kind of view themselves, like they all view the country as at its height. So every country thinks Macedonia should be part of it. Yes, you know, because it was once a part of, you know, Bulgaria was once big enough to encompass this and, and Serbia and, and Greece. And um, Greece was because because of Alexander. Mm, absolutely. Well, to be fair, they were all part of Macedonia. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were all Alex's. That's how it worked. Um, so it's it, one of the great mysteries of, of uh, modern archaeology, where his, his tomb. I didn't know that. We don't know where he is. Fascinating. We know where his dad is. We know his dad's tombs there, where it is, and that. But there are people right now in Macedonia searching desperately for Alexander the Great's tomb because nobody knows where it is. It's like one of these lost trails. There's um, several sites that people think is is where the body is. It's 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 a fascinating thing. There's there's a few of these in that part of the world where their their great former leaders and emperors and, and the like, their bodies have just vanished and nobody's quite sure where they are. There's a great book called Blood Makes Noise. It's uh, it's a detective novel, sort of, but it's it was written by Gregory Wyden, who wrote the Highlander films, and um, it's it's about the hunt for Eva Peron's body. Yeah, because didn't that end up in Spain for a bit? I believe so. Yeah, it's it's a really great read. I think you can still buy it on Amazon. Uh, going going back to Alexander, though, did I ever tell you I had a dream about meeting Alexander? <laughs> no. Yeah, I know. I mean, I know fuck all about history. I really don't. Um, but I had a dream that I was a hermit living in a little like clay mud shack type thing in the middle of the desert. And one day this massive army, not a massive army, but like a a number of soldiers began to approach Mm -hmm. and a man uh, came out of the front of them and he hailed me down and he identified himself as Alexander. And he said that they were trying, they were lost. And he said, he said, we're trying to go, I can't remember where, but he said, we're, we're trying to go somewhere. 
and we actually don't like we've got lost. Can you do you know which way to go? And I remember in the dream thinking that I knew where he wanted to go. Um, and it was one way. But behind me, if I sent them the wrong way, they would march into the desert. And by the time they figured out that I'd given them the wrong directions, it would be too late to turn back. And I remember in the dream having the thought, the mighty Alexander is balanced on the tip of my spear. And I sent him towards where it was he wanted to go. And him and his army thanked me and, and moved on. Um, and it was it. It was the most boring, <laughs> random dream in the world. But I had a dream where I met Alexander the Great and I gave him directions, which is hilarious because I'm in, in life I am – actually, no, I'm pretty good at giving directions, but not in the desert. <laughs> How strange. Yeah. Yeah. I Again, I, I don't – I'm not a history guy. Um, it's like I, I had a meeting or a dream once about – uh, a meeting of a meeting of Egyptian royalty or, or nobility, like uh, pre, and they were drinking this this really love. We were drinking this really lovely drink that I later learned was a real thing they drank back then. It's a mixture of oranges, brown sugar, and some kind of flour, like some kind of like brightly colored flour. It was really good. I remember drinking this. We were drinking it out of a out of a jug shaped like Nefertiti's head, and. <laughs> Is this like clay pot shaped like Nefertiti's head? <laughs> right. And uh, yeah, it was, it was good. And But I looked it up later and apparently that was a real thing that was drank at the time. That was like a, mm. a real drink from that from that period. So mm. th- there, part, it's part of this is a tiny little part of my brain that's not filled with hot dogs and pornography that apparently remembers two things I saw on History Channel when I fell asleep once. <laughs> there are worse things to remember from watching the History Channel. <laughs> this is true. This is true. All right, you want, to, you want to hit us with that bonus story? Yeah, so this bonus story is... Well, here's a story my grandmother told me. A long time ago, maybe in the 1960s, I'm not sure, my grandfather went to work in a neighbouring village, mowing some meadows with a lot of other men. In the evening, they were divided into two to three meadows, and then they heard something like an ox roaring and the ground began to shake a little. It wasn't an earthquake. Grandma's convinced for I know that that roar lasted for a while, and that it came from the forest. The men were so scared that they fled the meadow and wouldn't return until the following day. Also, the day after this, my grandfather died, and my uncle and grandmother went to the barn behind our house. Yeah, that was very Yorkshire, that. Went to the <laughs> barn. Went to our house. <laughs> my, un- my uncle and grandmother went to the barn behind our house, and they saw something that looked like a cat but much longer and moving strangely. They didn't know what it was, but there was a story about something that often happened when someone had died. And in the last story I remember, when I was in the village as a child, one night near the cemetery, something started barking or screaming. It was such a terrible sound that the whole village could hear it, and no one was allowed to go outside. I mean, I uh, I had to deal with screaming squirrels yesterday, so I get it, man. That shit's scary. They make a strange noise, a scared screaming squirrel. I once saw a squirrel stuck to a wall having a face off with a cat. Interesting. And it was the noise the squirrel was making that made me come outside to see what on earth could be making such a noise because I'd never heard it. I had never heard it either. I Nick has sort of tamed a handful of squirrels who live near our place. And uh, I'm, of course, I'm looking after the house while she's out of town. And uh, yeah, I, I put some peanuts down for one of them because that's what they expect now. But they, after they ate, they just sat outside and I heard this terrible, like, screaming, wheezing sound. And I stuck my head out the door and it was just this tiny ass squirrel, just, just shrieking for no apparent reason. I looked at him. I said, you're loud for a squirrel. And he sort of looked at me like, well, fuck you too. And he walked away. I want nuts. So that well, was. You got, you got nuts, you lazy little bastard. How much of these things do you want? You're getting fat. <laughs> it's got to store up for winter, man. Oh, there we go. Yeah, fair enough. Give She's got a hole. Well, we got a whole bag of them. She's got a whole like sanctuary out front that she she put she built herself a little rock garden. It's actually quite lovely. Um, but she's got like a a dish of water dish that birds will now go to, and uh, we call them we call them asbo raccoon. <laughs> when folks, if you if you're not from the UK, asbo is, it's an acronym for antisocial behavior order. Mm. Uh, and this raccoon will sometimes he'll just come in and wash his food in there, and you can tell because it's filthy in the morning. Or sometimes he'll just be pissy and, and toss it over like he's like Kiefer Sutherland after he's had too many. I've had enough of this shit. <laughs> Don't you know who I am? Where's my, my champagne? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm expecting that, honestly. The amount of seed and, and stuff that goes into the various feeders and 
I mean, it's quite lovely. I, I actually spend more time sitting out there now than I ever used to, but I just, it, it's hilarious that uh, now I have not only two cats drawing on my attention, but squirrels and birds as well. <laughs> Do you have gray or red squirrels in Canada? Uh, gray and black. Oh. We don't have no commie squirrels here in Canada. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a very hot topic in this country. Communism or red squirrels? Uh, red squirrels, because they're our native squirrel, and they've been near enough, well, not near enough eradicated, but obviously grey squirrels infect them with a virus that kills them. Holy shit, I didn't know that. And grey squirrels aren't natural to the UK. Oh. Escape pets. Oh, man. And so some people have basically started to kill them. The grey squirrels? Yes. Of all the, th- I guess you guys got tired of going to war with migrants, uh, so you voted those guys out, and now you're going to war with squirrels. So that, I guess it, we've moved up in the world, or down in the world. Anyway, it's an improvement. You're not hurting people. If it's come from abroad, they just don't like it, some people. And then, <laughs> that's why, <laughs> you know, the draw, they're like, chicken coma, fine. Gray squirrel, dead. <laughs> Again, so I works. think that's that's the right direction to be moving in. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> A movable feast. You'll laugh now, but I'll never forget this event. LM, grandfather and I, went to the village to farm. We started in the morning, grandmother packing a pot of beans and cakes for us to eat. We arrived in the village, and grandfather put the pot on the table in the dining room, and I put the cake next to it. We changed our clothes, locked the gate and door behind us, and went to the garden. We worked like fools until midday, when we were hungry. Sweating, we went back to the house to enjoy our beans. But when I entered the dining room, there was no more pot or cake on the table. I thought maybe the sun had baked my brain, or my grandfather was pranking me, so I went to put my head under the tap. As I turned on the water, grandfather called out and asked where the food was. I shouted back that I'd left it on the table, but it wasn't there. My head now dripping. I walked back into the dining room to help him look for the food. At one point, my grandfather bent down to pick up his shirt, which he'd knocked over, and found that the pot and the cake were now neatly placed upon the floor. In fact, the cake was atop the pot, both underneath the table, in exactly the centre of it. It was where I'd said I'd left it. It was just on the floor instead of the table. He and I looked at each other blankly for a couple of minutes. Nobody could have entered. We'd locked everything up behind us, and neither of us had gone back into the house since we started to work earlier in the day. Since nothing else seemed to be happening, we picked the beans and the cake up off the floor, put it back on the table, and dedicated it to our great-grandmother and great-grandfather. To this day, it's still not clear to us who could have placed it down there. Not a drop of it was spilt. It just somehow ended up on the floor. Once it happened in that very same house that voices were heard as if a radio was on. My mother rummaged through the whole house, but she couldn't find the radio that seemed to be playing. I don't even remember what it was I heard. I just remember hearing people talking. At first I thought it was our neighbours, or that someone had perhaps turned on the TV. And then I realised that there was no TV, radio, or any other device in the house that could have worked on that system. But it never happened again. I don't know what all that was about. I can't say I believe in ghosts. But it is creepy to find yourself in such a situation. I, I love, again, this is just another facet of, of doing a culture that's so different from ours, is that most of the stories on the show are like, boy, well, we were just two in the morning, we were driving to 7-Eleven to uh, have a big gulp. This is like, we were in the woods and a poltergeist moved our beans. <laughs> and we, we should have more like, we were working in the fields and poltergeist moved our beans stories. <laughs> All right. We have a bonus story here. Uh, and this is, well, this is more of a, a folklore thing, but my grandfather told me about the Drekovac from the Bagadan Strait. I, I, again, I apologize to the people of Serbia for what we're about to do to your language on this episode. The Bagadan Strait is a stretch near Jagodina, where the Velika Moraiva, the E-75 highway, the railway, and the hill run parallel to the strait. My grandfather once told me how one of his musician friends, a violinist, was riding a donkey back home. Again, riding a donkey. I love this was riding a donkey back home through the narrows after a dance and heard noises and breathing in the bushes and leaves. He saw an apparition going behind the trees and the sounds got closer and closer, and the donkey stood still when the sounds were heard. The musician took to playing the violin out of fear, and the sounds calmed down and subsided and he managed to pass and return home. 
Nedrekovac is supposedly a monstrous embodiment of an unbaptized child, which climbs on the victim's back, scratches, and bites. It has clearly engraved my consciousness, and I have come across stories about it all my life. But this one has remained the most memorable for me. And I had a look in the Drekovac. I, I assume you're familiar with the term, Paul. Yeah, it's it's a very... Um, it, it depends which part of the Slavic region you're in, because the Drevovic, uh, sorry, the Drevovac is described in numerous different shapes and forms. To some, it's a werewolf-type creature. To others, it's a ghost. To others, it's some kind of fae. There's, it, it seems to be one of those terms for something unnatural. Because I, I was thinking that what they were describing, the the unbaptized child, that, that's also similar to the Peroniac. Yes. Which, yeah, Luke has talked about that on his uh, Death from Above episode of Luke Lore. Yeah, it, it is. You, you see this. And it, like I say, it's one of those, wherever they claim something weird as be it a ghost or a, a haunting or a cursed area or whatever, they said the, the, the feeling will be it is a Dracovac. Now, what it, what version of the Dracovac it, it is depends on who's telling the story and where they live. So um, there have been a couple of modern flaps about the Dracovac. Uh, one of them is one of the most amusing solutions where people were convinced that it was a weird animal. Nobody knew what it could possibly be until they discovered it was just a corpse of a fox. Oh. However, there was a more recent flap uh, where several people were attacked by a creature that scratched and bit them uh, that occurred during the day. Um, and I think that was from about 10 years ago. And I'm not sure if that happened in Serbia or Bulgaria, because they're all very, they overlap in these particular areas. But there's certainly been modern alleged Dragovac slap, flap. There's one here that I found on Wikipedia. And again, I, I apologize to the people of Serbia for what I'm about to do to your language. Uh, Sredačka, <laughs> Sredačka Zupa. Oh, spot on, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's almost as good as my Spanish from the last episode. Oh! <laughs> It has been depicted in the form of a one-legged humanoid creature with glowing eyes that wanders around during nighttime and scares people. And I got to say, I'm not too worried about a one-legged cryptid. I, I think I can probably, I can't outrun much in this world, Paul, but I think I can outrun him. Uh, you'll be surprised. This sounds to me like you have firsthand knowledge of this. And, and if you told me you had run from a one-legged uh, Serbian ghost, I would believe you. Again, I'd be like, yeah, sure, fine. The only thing I can say about a one-legged cryptid is you'll be able to beat him in an ass-kicking competition. I don't know about, I can't kick real high is the thing. I got short legs. Like there's that, there's that scene in the very first episode of Cobra Kai where, uh, Daniel LaRusso, who is a very talented actor played by Ralph Macho, of course. Uh, but he does like a spin kick to kick a cup of coffee out of someone's hand, I think. And again, he, Ralph Macho can do far more martial arts at his age. I think he's in his fifties than I can in my early forties. Um, but it's still, that kick is one of the slow, like there are glaciers watching that kick move and getting bored. And uh, I remember watching it Cobra Kai with Nick and she went, oh God, it, that's sad. And <laughs> that is still better than any kick I could possibly do. <laughs> but yes, so um, there's a few of these and, and, and this is not just limited to Serbia. There are certain terms for certain unnatural creatures, ghosts, spirits, vengeful demon, monsters witches, whatever. And they all seem to have like a catch-all term. And I think that, I think we in the West try to use the term to describe one particular thing. But when you, when you start to dig into it, you realize that it seems to be uh, a, a term that can apply to lots of different things. Because I think you, you can probably find six or seven examples of different variations of it. And they're very dissimilar to each other. They're not, they don't sound the same thing. It's a couple that is supposed to be embodiments of dead children or children that died tragically, but the rest of them are weird monsters. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, there's a list on Wikipedia. I'll try to remember to put a link in the show notes. Um, but yeah, it, there is a, a real, um, as I say, a real range, like vampire, like undead men, a uh, long neck legged creature with a cat like head. I'd be hooped for that one. I'd be going, look at him. Come here, big guy. And then it would just rip my throat out. <laughs> it might be a weird cat, you know, they're quite, uh, they're the lesser common version of the werewolf, but most werecat stories emanate from Eastern Europe. Interesting. Oh, how how awful would that be? Your cat's curled up on your on your lap, you're rubbing its stomach, and all of a sudden it's just some dude who looks like me, but he's wearing a loincloth. <laughs> Tickle me again, big boy. <laughs> Do not stop. 
Where are your dreamies? <laughs> Please turn back into a cat. No. <laughs> Not till I've had my dreamies. <laughs> Oh, there you go, folks. Every cat you pet could be me in disguise. (laughs) (laughs) The Ruins When I was a kid, me and two of my friends, we loved playing in the woods. Often we would make bows and arrows from the corpse wood and play. Since we were from the village, the untouched nature was all around us. One day we played until much later into the early evening than we used to. And I was mad at one of my friends because he'd hit me in the back of the head with one of his arrows and I wanted to get back at him. Once I felt like I'd got him back enough, we started to go back to our camp, which was essentially one oak tree, quite old and large with a recess we could all fit in. So we found it interesting. When we came down, we noticed we couldn't find our third friend. And knowing the beatings we could expect if we returned without him, we headed right back to find him. First, we headed to the trench, which was actually a former trench from the First World War, where we loved to play. It was not there. We continued on to a mill that was a little further into the woods, and then to the haunted forest, as we called it, which was essentially a conifer forest connected to the deciduous, which, because of that difference, seemed to us like it could be haunted. It was also cold all the time, but that was probably because it was at the foot of a hill. Anyway, there was no friend anywhere. At one point... It was as if we had heard someone shouting our names, but from a completely different direction. It seemed to be coming from the forest at the foot of a river we almost never went to, because we had been told not to play there. I started running as fast as my legs could carry me, so much so that I lost a sneaker, which was only a couple months old. When we came to the place from which the sound was heard, we saw an opening in the ground about a meter from where the bar was peeking out. And folks, uh, this is translated, again, directly from Serbian. I do not speak Serbian, so there's going to be some things that just don't make a lot of sense, but uh, bear with me. It was as if there was a rest of a building, but in a forest, in a village of 500 people between two irrelevant cities. My friend was down there. He yelled through tears that he had fallen by accident and that we couldn't tell his mom what had happened. He was so scared and cried so much that I started shaking, even though I was the bravest otherwise of them. Since he couldn't get out alone and I was the tallest and the oldest, I decided to go down to him. However, when I got down there, I found myself literally in a concrete corridor. There was rancid water all around, and I glanced at my foot that didn't have a sneaker. The corridor was maybe a meter wide and five to six meters long with two doors at the end, one metal on the left side and the other metal but rolled on the right. My legs were shaking with fear, but I had to see what was down there. As I was slowly approaching, my anger at my friend for getting into this situation was lessened by the sound of his crying, and when I ended... And when I ended up in the room, I was surprised. There was an armchair, old and torn, and one one picture on the wall that I could not see well, but I remember there being a fox drawn on it. There was another hole in the corner of the room, about a meter wide but narrow, through which a little natural light could be seen. The picture was drawn totally amateurishly, as if by a child, and there were patterns around it which I could not recognize. My friend was happy to see me, and I helped boost him up through one of the holes where the light was coming through. I then went back to the place where I had entered, and they helped pull me back up together. However, after that, my friend was a little different. He said originally that a man took him to that hole, and the militia became involved. He later changed his account and said that a voice called him from there. The militia dismissed it, but although we were kids, we knew something had happened. We just didn't know what. After all, he told us the same story he told everyone else. Several months afterward, his parents divorced and he moved with his mother to Kraljevo where I think he still lives today. The forest in which he fell was eventually flattened to the ground to make way for a path to the village over the hill. Interestingly, no one has ever mentioned any ruins below, nor did we manage to see any remains during the construction of the road. To this day, I have no idea what happened. My theory is that it may be a bunker from the First or Second World War. Maybe they didn't find it because they didn't dig deep enough? But who knows? And I I gotta be honest, Paul, when I first read that, I kind of thought, this just seems like someone lured a kid into a bunker in the forest. But the fact that they didn't find it when they were building the road or didn't seem to find it when they were building the road, I thought gave it enough of a mystical element that they didn't feel quite as bad telling the story. Or it was a mass grave and they didn't want to admit to it because it was a war crime. Oh, yeah, there could be that too. I hadn't considered that. I always think of the worst things when it comes to history. Well, I mean, you know, as we've talked about on the show before, I mean, 
with uh, there's some stories from Croatia that are just covers for what the partisans did after the war. So uh, yeah, it's not impossible. Oh, absolutely, they're all over the place in in Europe, sadly, because especially Second World War, um, you had a lot of a lot of sides just basically going through the uh, what was called the scorched earth policy, where you left nothing standing. Yeah, it, again, it's, it's the the so much of this was like totally unknown to me, but it is genuinely upsetting. Yeah, well, it's like I say, it's a part of Europe that when everybody talks about, especially the Second World War, they talk about what happens in the north, and they concentrate on France and Belgium and the Netherlands and Italy and Austria and Germany and everywhere else. All the other countries, Hungary, Romania, Poland, obviously gets mentioned because it clear, clear point, Czechoslovakia as it was now, it's now Czechia and Slovakia. And, and you've got all these other places that were all theatres of war where the Nazis were just sweeping through them and then you've got the Russians coming in on one side, you've got the Allies coming in. There's bodies all over the place in these places and they just they never get a look in because they fell into Eastern Europe because they fell under Russian control after the end of the Second World War. And so we've no idea what went on there from sort of 1945 to the early 90s. With 50 years of history, we're not aware of most of it. Yeah, that's a, that's a really fascinating way to put it. You're absolutely right. I know when we, we did the Haunting of Poland episode a long time ago, I mean, I wouldn't say it's a black box, but there was a lot of gaps and things that you just, it's, it's very difficult to sort of delve into. I, I think especially if you're trying to do what we're doing, which is approaching it from a, an English language perspective. You know, I mean, I, like this, like that story was literally from the r slash Serbia subreddit, and I had to translate it from Serbian into English and then try and like actually make it flow to a certain degree. Mm. Um, but how much information out there is kind of not accessible to us because it's not English? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, um, I mean, and Serbia will be amongst dozen, a dozen or so countries where they've probably got as much spooky history that we're just never going to fine unless we really dig into it or we're fortunate enough to meet somebody from that country who can speak English better than we can butcher their whole language. <laughs> <laughs> and that's no criticism of you, by the way, I'm just saying. <laughs> I, you know, there's um, uh, two things. One, I was, I was going to recommend uh, for folks who are interested in a film that kind of deals with this topic, there's a, it's a, it's a drama, but it's, it's very well executed. It's called The Silent Forest. It's a German film from tw uh, 2022. And it is a sort of a mystery that deals with things like this, like like Paul was talking about with mass graves. It, it sort of deals with the the burden of guilt and responsibility carried over from that period. It's a really solid little detective movie, and it's very German in that the entire climax of the film hinges on soil composition. So that's uh, again the Silent Forest. You can I think it's on Prime, but it's a really solid movie. And uh, the other thing I was going to say has gone completely out of my mind. So if it comes back to me, I will mention it. But I, <laughs> I have blanked completely on what the second thing was going to be. <laughs> God almighty. Got to love that. I, it was funny. I was going to get to the silent forest out of the way first because I thought, oh, that's sort of like a not really important detail. But if I get it out of the way, then I can focus on the important thing. And my brain went, oh, you dumb bastard. Mass graves. It was about mass graves. Death. Murder. Might have been about war. mass graves, death, murder, war. Nope, it's all it's gone. I'm sure it'll come back to me at three in the morning when my cats wake me up for attention. <laughs> the tall man. Last night I was driving back from a trip heading to Novosad, Vonovina in Serbia, which was near the village of Parage. I experienced something really strange. It was around ten PM when I saw a very tall figure appear out of nowhere on the road. It stayed there for a few seconds before quickly sliding into the bushes and trees on the right side. This figure was about two metres tall, but it didn't look like a person or an animal, though its movements seemed somewhat familiar. It was blurry and grey, or well, it seemed like that. I was driving at around 90 kilometres an hour, so I didn't have much time to react. My car has automatic high beams, and they turned off and on again, as if another car was passing. There were no other cars around. When I reached the spot where it disappeared, I looked into the direction it went, but I saw nothing. I then checked my rearview mirror, and I saw it again near the trees. This time it was still, but I quickly lost sight of it. I asked my boyfriend if he'd seen it too, but he said he was looking the other way and hadn't noticed anything. I wasn't under the influence of any medication or drugs or alcohol, so it couldn't have been that. 
When we arrived to our destination, I opened maps to see what is behind those bushes and trees. Turns out, there's a cemetery there that's as large as the village itself. That whole night I just kept getting goosebumps thinking about what I'd seen. I'm not sure if it was a ghost or something else. But I've never seen a ghost or experienced anything paranormal firsthand. Well, I, I think you have, my guy. I think you have. I, I don't know what else you how I was going to explain that. It's an ent. Oh, there we go. Obviously. Yeah, what was I thinking? How silly of me. Come on, open up. <laughs> well, speaking of, of opening up and uh, <laughs> getting woke to the mysteries of, of the universe. <laughs> last night, I, I was I went to the, after I finished like putting the script together, I went to the Tiki Bar downtown. <laughs> and <laughs> so I was sitting there having my, having my uh, Blue Hawaiian. And I was reading about Mount, now again, people of the entirety of people of the, of the Balkans, uh, Mount Ruten. Is that the UFO mountain? Yes. No, I don't know about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, folks, there's this mountain, and Paul will tell us more, but uh, there's a mountain about 200 kilometers southeast of uh, Belgrade called Mount, uh, again, I'm going to fuck it up, Mount Ruten. It is the center of a lot of different conspiracy theories. Some people believe, uh, well, I'll let Paul tell you the, 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 the majority of it, but I will say that uh, it uh, in 2012, when a bunch of very, very <laughs> unclever people thought the world was coming to an end because they didn't understand how calendars work, they tried to go there. And I found this great ABC News article about how all these people thought that that would be the one place that was safe from the apocalypse. And this poor bastard who runs it in there, he says, I have room for four people. I have six right now. I cannot take any more. These people, there's no grocery store. I don't know what they're expecting, but we have nothing they're looking for. And they were so mad. These people were coming to their tiny town and just fucking things up because they thought the mountain would save them. But, but Paul, could you tell the fine folks why they thought the mountain might save them? They were convinced they were, they'd become part of a doomsday cult. It's always been a very spiritual area to the, to the local people, I believe there's a chapel built on the top of it. It's one of those things that nobody understands how it, how they built got there. There's just a, a chapel on the top. Well, apparently, I looked into that. It was uh, the local village. It took a thousand people lugging stones up that <laughs> mountain. But then, some years later, someone blew it up because they thought there was treasure underneath it. Yes. So imagine being the people in that village. I would have torn that dude apart like Tommy Lee Jones at the end of Natural Born Killers. <laughs> So it's it's always had a connection to the weird and the supernatural. There's a there's a plant that grows on it, uh, which is called something like winter savory, which they use in a lot of cooking and teas, and it's supposed to be very therapeutic and and has medicinal properties. And so it's always been a kind of pilgrimage place for people of varying belief systems. And if I can just jump in, one of the things that every article insisted on mentioning about that tea was that it's an aphrodisiac. <laughs> and like every single article was like, by the way, this stuff is great for your boner. And I, <laughs> thanks, I guess. Um, and which is funny because I, I, we're talking about this now. I actually turned down uh, uh, an ad. No, it wasn't a guaranteed ad, but like filling out the, the uh, application for the supplement company because I read their copy and they, they wanted us. There's a lot of words in there. I'm like, no one wants to hear us say this. No one wants to hear. Can you give us a personal endorsement of no? <laughs> yeah, let me talk on my show about the boner pills I took because that's what my audience wants to hear from either of us. <laughs> no, thanks, guys. Thanks. <laughs> but here we are talking about it anyways, thanks to Serbia's uh, Boner Mountain Tea. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this cult, who I've forgotten the chap who was leading it. Unsurprisingly, it was a man. Um, <laughs> but he, he'd become obsessed with the Mayan calendar and believed it was, were, was, was real, obviously, and therefore his cult was following the Mayan calendar and therefore they were told that they had to make this pilgrimage there to be picked up by a UFO. So it's, it's basically a, a, a collection of cult tropes that he's <laughs> mashed together um i know people have said if you make the climb it's about 15 kilometers up a very uh, steep incline and people will want a ufo to be there at the end so they can get down <laughs> to the, the other 
side without climbing down the bloody thing. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's also attracted ancient aliens and uh, people who believe in the, the lost archaeology of the world because it's a mountain that, to some people, idiots, uh, looks very <laughs> similar to a pyramid. And therefore, it must have been built by aliens because mountains aren't tall, spiky things all around the world. No, no. no. And weather does not destroy rock over years. It doesn't. It doesn't happen, Brennan. And Ooh. so it's clearly part of the International Alien Pyramid Collection that idiots still try and um, put forward in their slightly badly disguised racist rhetoric about peoples of colour being unable to build anything because they weren't white. Yeah. And we can't forget all the conspiracy theories about the chambers and tunnels inside and, and how... Have uh, you seen them too? Uh, yeah, right? I know. I had some of that tea and they were there. <laughs> I had some of the tea. I was, I was busy with other things. <laughs> I, <laughs> Chasing was some goats. <laughs> I, again, I, was, I, I read a bunch of articles about, about this mountain. And one of the things I noticed, and, and this is always comes up when you're researching stuff like this when you see a lot of many say or some have said that's when the alarms start going off right like when, when i years back when we were talking about pavelia and uh, as we did again on a recent episode haunting of italy you know you many say some say and it's the same shit in every article um there was a thing about there's a legend that roman soldiers were uh would were taken into the tunnel because it had healing properties and they were healed there and i thought boy i want to see the 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 proof of this that there is some sort of like weapon x facility down there for for injured roman soldiers and not just a bunch of guys getting high on boner tea and as you say chasing around goats i mean this is the thing if if there'd have been any gold under that mountain the nazis would have blown the bloody thing up <laughs> sure 100 <100%. laughs> percent. anything else they thought gold was in they blew that up why would they not blow all that up they blew they blew most of europe up let's be fair <laughs> Did you, uh, I, I saw an, a, a one thing, and I, again, I don't know if it's true or not. I figure you're the man to ask. Um, because, you know, as Hitler's former travel secretary, I figure you'll know this. <laughs> I do have an A-level in, uh, in, in the rise of the Nazi party, official, essentially. That's my, my A-level history is all about, I got it because of Nazis. <laughs> there we go. Paul Bestel, resident Hitlerologist. That's official. It's going on the website. <laughs> but one, one of the articles, Hitlerologist, yeah, yeah. Uh, the degree in Hitleronomy. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, the, one of the articles I read claimed that Hitler had gone there, but I don't know if that's true or not. Because, and I, again, they, they they try to tie it into like the Thule Society and all that shit. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. Do you have any thoughts? I'd be very surprised. Yeah, that was kind of what I thought too. I'm very surprised. He he didn't leave Germany very much during the war, and uh, I can't see the Nazis just swanning into Yugoslavia in 1937. A lot of that, during that period, they were, they were spending, they were sending a lot of expeditions to Tibet and Nepal um, because they were looking for evidence of the master race and their, their beliefs and, and scientists had kind of claimed that their lineage and genetic ideology could be traced back to essentially uh the mystical lands of Tibet and Nepal and, and northern India. And so the Nazi scientists were running running around Mount Everest in the early 30s looking for archaeological evidence that supported that they were descended from the master race. Oh, Christ. So I don't think they would have had time to nip down to Yugoslavia. They were too busy everywhere else. Yeah, Hitler was too busy jack being jacked up on pervert and fucking up his war. <laughs> I'm thinking well, he might have only gone there for some tea. <laughs> but yeah I, I i no i i doubt that very much yeah no fair enough it, it seemed like one of those things where you know they it, because it's got the such a, an outsized reputation where people like to fold in historical figures uh, you know especially again there's all these sort of um half truths about the nazi obsession with the occult some of which of course you know, is accurate based on what i understand but not to the degree that some people would like to think you know, we won't, I don't want to dwell on this much because I, I don't like talking about Nazis except to make fun of them. Um, but it's something that I, I've really kind of learned a lot about uh, the last little while. I've been, 
you know, as, as folks, you might have noticed, I've been a lot more up on research with shit like this and, and, and like trying to trying harder on the show. And it's because I was kind of inspired by a suite of podcasts I started listening to. But uh, one of the things I picked up from that suite of podcasts, one of which is a history show, is that people love to attribute a lot more strength and capability to fascists than they actually have. And that was one of the things they talked about with, with the Nazis um, is like th these stories about their, their like military or their overwhelming military might and things like this. By and large, they're just not true. And, you know, they're, they're like inescapable power and, and so on. Like, and, but it, it's kind of become the legend, like the legend has sort of superseded history. And uh, a friend of mine is working, I have to be very general here. A friend of mine is working in a place where their coworker has hit that midlife crisis point where a lot of mediocre people suddenly take a turn into kind of standing for, for fascists. And that's, he has now thrown out all these long debunked facts about, you know, the, the in unstoppability of, of the, the German forces of that time. And my friend is actually, uh, her and, and her, and her partner are experts on the subject. Her partner, especially he is, uh, a, a scholar of that era and every single thing this man has asserted is, is completely incorrect. But this, again, the legend has taken over the truth. Yeah, they were, they were, they were on their ass by the end. You know, they were, they were conscripting 10, 11, 12 year old boys into the army by that point. They were reeling from the Italian surrender. They'd got the allies coming in from the east. They got the Russians coming in from the west. They couldn't get anywhere. They were trapped. And it was simply a matter of time. I mean, they'd obviously clearly begun to deal in, in building pretty substantial rockets and missiles, as we were testament to here, the amount of doodle bugs that hit us. And they were trying to build, you know, when, when we took Germany, eventually, we, we found that they were building these enormous battleships that were allegedly in, intended to invade America. But they hardly had any soldiers left by the end. And they were so fed up. You know, they weren't getting the supplies. They got no weapons. They were living in shit. The kit didn't work. They were, they, they lost hundreds of thousands of men trying to take Russia because apparently Hitler is a great tactician, but he doesn't know what Napoleon did and therefore just <laughs> repeated the exact same mistake that Napoleon did by trying to take Russia. You don't invade Russia in fucking autumn, you dickhead. Right? If you're going to go to Russia, you go in spring. You don't go when it's about to turn to minus 40 and the Russians know you're coming. And so they just want you to chase them and they trick them, chase them all the way into like three, 400 miles into Russia. And then when they realized that they, the Russians were just waiting for them and just blowing the shit out of them, they thought, right, well, we best go back. Forgetting that as they march forwards, the Russians had destroyed everything, every field, every tree, every farmhouse, every building. It was like they dropped a nuclear bomb on that part of the earth. And so you had all these men trying to get back. Most of them froze to death on the way home. Right, yeah, yeah. And so by the time they got back, I think they lost 160,000 soldiers trying to take Russia. Holy shit. So they're not that fucking strong, are they? Not that bright either. That's it. Again, it's like time just becomes, it's, it's this thing where people start picking the choosing and trying to, again, they want to remember a version of it that, uh, I don't know why there's some, again, there's something about mediocre people that just, I guess, flock to the illusion of strength. But, um, well, it is. I mean, if they were that strong, they'd have taken us. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Anyway, it's 21 miles. That's all it is. They got to Jersey, which is, you know, it's one of those things people forget. The Jer Jersey, the Channel Islands became Nazi occupied during World oh, War II. I didn't II. know that. Yeah. 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 They, huh. they, they took the Channel Islands, the Nazis. That's as far as they got. Um, they tried a couple of excursions and were rebuffed both times, but they never tried to make a frontal assault. And then they, that's what people go, oh, well, they were, they were super strong, but they were dealing with conflicts all over Europe and all the re resistance movements in all these countries, the French resistance, the Dutch, the Belgians, even the people in Germany who were actively fighting against the Nazis. You've got people in Austria doing it. You've got the Italians chasing side. They were fighting in Africa which everybody seems to forget. You've got most of Northern Africa was a war zone. They were trying to invade Russia. They'd taken Scandinavia. And that's why they just started panicking left, right, and center. From about 1943 onwards, they were on the slide. As with all bullies and scumbags, once you start pushing back, you realize there's not a whole lot there. I mean, to be fair, they wanted us, and there were a lot of people in this country 
um, especially in the upper classes, that yes. completely agreed with Hitler's ideologies. Oswald Mosley is a prime example. But, you know, people always talk about the Wallace Simpson scandal bringing down the king before the Second World War. But it was more to do with him being a Nazi sympathizer and visiting Hitler in Germany that was more to do with it. The Wallace Simpson thing seemed to be a very convenient um, aspect to it that allowed them to kind of move him out without saying, oh, we've got to get rid of the king. He's a, he's a horrific racist. <laughs> um, and so his, his, his brother took the throne and we ended up with the different side of the Windsors running it as, as we do to this very day here in the, in the UK. But um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot to unpick in that particular period of time. That's why I found it so fascinating, that whole build up from Hitler taking power um, and, and then running amok and, and the amount of um, people that agreed with him in, in worryingly powerful positions and kept thinking, well, it'll never happen here. If we agree with him, we'll never happen here. And then you end up with, with what kicked off from September 1939, sadly. All right, so we are coming back. I probably I don't know how much of that is going to stay in the show. We had a <laughs> a really great chat about the Second World War. Sorry, uh, set me off. No, no, no. It's it very. I love it. I'm, I'm I I always admire how much you know, and I love learning from you. I just I don't know how much uh, how much our listeners will uh, <laughs> want to take on board about the atrocities of the war, but we'll see how much stays in. Like I say, sadly, it's 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 something I know a lot about because it's it's deeply interesting and it's it's deeply emotional and it's deeply emotive. And I think it's there are aspects to it that people just don't know enough about. No, oh, I couldn't agree more. All right. So we're going to take a little break from the regular format here to share with you something that we're going to call the Rainmaker. And uh, we're calling it that well, because that's actually the name that was uh, used on one of the stories we found. But I was so interested in this. Uh, there are several different uh, bits to this, all from different places. That I, I kind of pieced it together. And one of them was so compelling, I actually sent it to Paul right away. I said, does this, this sound familiar to you? And it really does, eh? Oh, absolutely. Um, without wishing to spoil it for anybody, I think once you hear this story, it's very similar. You can draw the parallels from whichever culture you identify with, I think. Yeah. So again, this this is several pieces uh, from different people translated from Serbian to English using Google Translate, so it's not going to be perfect. Again, I've touched it up as much as possible. So we'll start here. I have a rather strange story. The grandfather of a childhood friend, by the way, the grandfather is a completely normal man, healthy, not senile, went to buy cigars one morning and disappeared for three years. The disappearance was properly reported. He was searched for, but after a while they gave up. I should mention that we live in the city, not in the country. The strange part is that the grandfather came back after three years, wearing the same clothes he left with, which were not worn out or faded, and he had no memory of where he had been for three years. No explanation from his side whatsoever. The doctors attributed it to senility. So someone else said, I know the same story, but it's about the mother of a man from a village near Lubovia. Sorry, Serbia. Given that we are not close, I did not believe in the credibility of the story for a long time until a retired cop confirmed it to me in one of our informal conversations. Moreover, he said that he was the one who compiled the report. He said at first he thought she had disappeared with some money that she allegedly received from an inheritance, until later it was learned that money had not yet been deposited into her account at the time of her disappearance. The militia gave up the search for her, only to have her reappear exactly one year later, in the same clothes, without any other physical changes. The strangest thing of all, the morning she had gone missing, she had cut her hand while making breakfast. When she reappeared a year later, she still had that same cut. I have heard this story from several people, and several people have confirmed it is true. The woman is supposedly still alive, still talking about it. That same cop told me she was also in Borba, the former newspaper, with that story. Now, this is, um, this is a, a separate story. This is where the title Rainmaker comes from. The person says, In the stories I heard from the old people when I was little, the rainstorm was an event that happened and was described only in Western Serbia. And the first cases happened back at the time of the Turks. And Paul, the time of the Turks, would that have been like the 19th century? The uh, Turkish sort of incursion lasted to around the, the sort of middle of the 19th century famously punctuated by uh, the charge of the Light Brigade, which is one of Britain's stupidest wartime decisions. <laughs> How best to take some ca cannons up a mountain? Send some men on horses to attack them. I mean, I guess if you, you know, one of those guys has been sleeping with your wife, you're going to get rid of them real fast. Yeah, so it kind of fell apart sort of 
1850s, 1860s. Okay. So, all right. So, we'll go back to the story. So, this uh, the first cases happened back in the time of the Turks. Namely, in some regions, there was a... Ver- now, uh, folks, this was translated several different ways, depending on the, the engine I used to translate it. So, the, the, virgin I'm, the version I'm going to go with is there was a virgin named Katika who punished people who were very evil. She would kill them with some disease or accident or something like that. However, if there was a reason why that person became evil, either through revenge or disappointment or sadness, then she would invite them to talk. She would show them their life from the moment they were born until that day. She simply tried to recover them from evil. If that person were to return, i.e. recover, it would rain heavily that day, which is why the phenomenon was named Rainy Man or Rainmaker. And if she remained dis- and if the person stayed disappeared, then she would be called cursed. They would usually come home soaked to the skin, usually one year after the disappearance, in the same clothes as if only seconds or hours had passed for them. They would forget everything that had happened to them, and it would really feel to them like only seconds or hours had passed. The story became famous when a Turk allegedly returned with a memory, because he was a fellow believer and did not have Slavic origins like us. He described what happened in detail, and then the search for that virgin started, and many, girl, and many girls who looked like her were killed. A few days later, during the transfer of the Turkish company from that place to another, the entire company disappeared and was never found or appeared anywhere. And one last thing I want to mention is another note I found. Again, this was translated from Serbian. Fairies are the most mentioned mythical creatures in my area. Usually people see them next to willows, oaks, or some other old and big trees. My grandfather won't let us cut down one big one on the farm because he supposedly saw a fairy there. Also in the green grass in the spring, they say you can see bright green circles, fairy carts, and that whoever steps in them will be killed by fairies. I assume it was left over from the old Slavs because they also had a cult of fairies and big trees that they respected very much, and that has been preserved in some modified form until today. And so I saw that, and again, it's not a story typically like we would tell on the show, uh, because I had to trim a lot of stuff out because there's just no obvious translation, but Paul, does that not sound a lot like Missing 411? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I think it just shows you once again that it doesn't matter where you go in the world, there'll all be versions of the things we are aware of and scared of and know of. And they've been with us as long as people can write things down and share these stories going back thousands of years. It covers all aspects of it. And you could say, is it missing 411? Is it the Fey? Is it the little people? Is it alien abduction? And well, yeah, I say I say missing four and one because it's a handy catch all. You know, it sort of expresses what I'm yes. talking about. I don't. I I kind of think David's gone off well and gone off the deep end. But you know, again, I think the core idea of what he was talking about, I think, is really compelling, and I really think there's something there. So, also, folks, when I say that, I don't. I I'm not. Uh, I'm not on side with with uh, old Mister P there. But I think before before everything went south, I think there was something interesting being documented. And uh, again, it show, as like you say, Paul, it shows that this has been around for a very long time, called a number of different things all across the world. I mean, even in fiction, depending on where you are in the world, the most famous fictional story of this particular kind of thing is Rip Van Winkle, isn't it? Oh, of course. I never thought about that. But yeah, that would be. Which was, was obviously Washington Irving. Um, I believe he wrote that while he was on holiday in England. No kidding. <laughs> I think it I think it was. It might be. I might be wrong. But I know people have said that there was an earlier version of that story, which is a German folk story called Peter Klaus, which is essentially the same kind of story, just all the names are different. Oh, interesting. So it that you know, that's going back. I think Rip Van Winkle is two hundred years old. It was early nineteenth century. Um, And Peter Klaus predates that publication of that particular story. So that must be, you know, you're talking 250 years that these kinds of stories have been told as a, as a folk tale or a, or a, a a fictional mystery. If I'm not mistaken, back when I used to listen to um, Mysterious Universe, they, they found a story from China where someone had, uh, where a woman, same thing had happened. Like the woman had gone somewhere. She thought she'd been gone for uh, a few hours and she had been gone long enough. I want to say a hundred years or something like that. Like long enough that everyone she knew was dead. Yeah. There's a very similar story, um, similar themes anyway, in Judaism where I believe it's a very odd story, but it's the kind of thing about uh, some seer bumps into a man and he's planting a tree, I think. 
And he says to him, oh, why are you planting that tree? And he says, well, I'm not planting it for me because it'll take 70 years to bear fruit. So I'm growing it for my grandchildren. And then all of a sudden he becomes very tired and he falls asleep. And then when he wakes up, the tree is bearing fruit. And so he says to this person who's picking the fruit off it, did you plant that tree? And he said, no, my grandfather planted it 70 years ago. Oh, man. Sam, that story's 2,000 years old. Right. Holy shit, yeah. So you, you, will, you will find stories in, in very similar there. So it's, it's something that's been with us, this missing time aspect, people disappearing and reappearing for no reason. But that's quite an interesting aspect to it, that a storm seems to predate that someone has returned, as though, it's, yeah. as though the sky is cleansing both them and the area from wherever they've been, yeah. being washed washed of their disappearance it would seem it occurs to me too that's sort of the the story of the apocryphal gospel of enoch yes uh, you know uh methuselah's was it methuselah's father i think so yes yeah uh you know god it, it, he was taken and, and if i'm not mistaken that legend is a, like it, it, that that story of like a special uh like a man with a special son because obviously methuselah was said to be i think like the oldest man in the bible um I think that repeats or that originates in Sumeria. I think there's a, a Sumerian story about a man with a very blessed son and the, the father goes missing. And of course, in the Bible, Enoch is taken and shown things that do not correspond to anything else in sort of the, which you might call like the official Bible. Um, it's a really fascinating read. I've, I've, I've talked about on the show before. Uh, I have a really beautiful version of it that I found in a, in a used bookstore a couple of years back. Um, but yeah, it, it, Enoch, is, he's shown all these things that actually, in some ways, the descriptions are probably a closer to what we consider modern UFO lore. Yes. You know, there's like uh, crystal ships and, and uh, one of the things I found most disturbing was the binding place of the angels. He, he has shown a place where angels are punished, which is particularly upsetting. Yes, Rotherham. <laughs> the Zeman Shadow. In 2016... I was stuck for two days in a children's cardiology ward in Zuman Hospital for a 24-hour ECG. Usually, they try to do these at home, but obviously children aren't trusted that they'll keep it on correctly. The ward is in a separate building from the communist-era-built annex, and is a really old and small two-story building, going all the way back to the 1800s. I was alone in a huge room with some beds. Alone, because for some strange reason... I was one of the three kids on the floor, which excluding the babies and mothers, which had a separate room. I didn't see much of the other two. One was a girl with measles, and the other boy was just alone in his own room. So I got the big room for myself. This room was rectangular shaped with beds lined up against each wall. So I took the one in the upper left corner and wheeled the TV cart right in front of it. Well, because nobody else was going to watch it apart from me. As night fell, I stayed up past midnight. A nurse came in, turned off the lights and told me to go to sleep. And after a while, I turned that television off and laid on my side. It was moonlit outside that lightened the room. I closed my eyes and waited for sleep to take over me, but it never came. I had a sudden urge to open my eyes. What I saw was a really tall nun-like figure, which is weird because Serbia is an Orthodox country we don't have the classical Catholic nun. However, we do have some minority Catholics. This figure stood in the centre of the room. I know it wasn't sleep paralysis. I could move, but I just laid low. She walked, or maybe she floated. Her garments were hiding her legs, to each bed. She stood next to each bed for a few moments, and then proceeded to the next one. And she did this for every bed in the room. Skipping mine, however... After that, she walked to the door, came back to the centre, and disappeared. A year after, I googled some history, and it turns out that this building was a frontline hospital for Austro-Hungarian soldiers during the First World War, as Zeman was a border town between Austria-Hungary and Serbia. This hospital was run by the local nuns of the Franciscan Monastery in Zeman, which still exists to this very day. All right, we're going to take our second ad break and we'll be right back with more stories. Next up is a trilogy of stories from small towns in Serbia, calling the segment Village of Screams. This is the first story. 
I started living with my grandparents about four years ago, without knowing how that would change me and my thinking forever. We live in a small village in West Serbia, and it's a kind of place where everyone knows each other. At first, I didn't notice anything strange. I started hearing footsteps going up the stairs and faint slamming of the windows. I dismissed all of it until one morning I couldn't find my shirt for school. We searched the entire house and found it in the long room, spread out on a cradle. Now, just for the record, there is one large room across from my bedroom that we call the long room, and it mostly contains stuff we don't use anymore. You should also know I am the only one on the floor. There are three rooms, my bedroom, another bedroom, and the long room. My parents sleep downstairs. After that, I started being afraid. One night, three of my friends, I'll call them D, N, and M, were sleeping over. We were on the balcony drinking coffee when something in my room slammed and fell. We just dismissed it and continued talking. After a while, I went to the bathroom, and as I was going down the stairs, I heard footsteps behind me. When I was going upstairs, I heard it again. I told my friends, and they thought I was trying to prank them, but at that moment, we heard something from my bedroom. It was a sound like things were flying and smashing. We were too scared to go in and see. We were 17 at that time, so it wasn't that long ago. It was 3 a.m. when we finally worked up the nerve to go in. Everything was in its place. No things were smashed or moved. But as I entered the hallway, everything became very quiet, and I felt breathing down my neck. We ran out to the balcony and locked ourselves out there till 7 a.m. when we felt safe to go in. I won't tell you about everything that's happened, but I will tell you about one more. I was left home alone, and I suddenly heard a female voice downstairs. I got scared, but I didn't want to think about it too much. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw books stacked on my desk move slightly. When I turned my attention to them, they just fell down. I called my friend quickly, and he told me to get out of there. I was too scared to do that. Only when I heard my dogs barking intensely did I run down the stairs to check on them. When I looked through the window, I saw them all sleeping, but I could still hear the barking. Suddenly the barking stopped, and some kind of scream was heard from the hallway. My friend told me to get inside now, and I, terrified, told him I was going inside. I was going to go upstairs. I heard that same scream again, from the empty bedroom upstairs, which had belonged to my now-dead great-grandmother. Later, when my grandparents came home, I found the clocks in the house stopped at 1.55 p.m., the same time they left the house. What does that sound like, Pod? It sounds poltergeisty almost. Yes, very much so. Um, but it, it reminds me of a, an, another haunting incident that is very similar to that. I'm trying to think which case it's reminding me of. I can't remember if I'd spoken to somebody or we were talking about a particular case, but there's one where somebody passed away and the clocks had stopped at the exact time they'd passed. I can't remember which one it was. Interesting. But it's not that un- uncommon a trend in, in bereaved. It's almost as if it's uh, time marks the passing of it, even if you're not aware that things have happened. Does this extend to uh, sort of digital, like a digital clocks or electric clocks, or is it just things that have a mechanism? I'm not sure. I know I've, I've, I've heard of UFO sightings where witnesses in cars... Their clocks have changed or they've lost time or whatever, or they're just flashing as though they've been yeah. reset and not at, and not set up again properly. Um, I'm not sure if anybody's kind of noticed that in regards to digital clocks, or they probably, or they, if they do, would they just consider that just to be some kind of electronic malfunction? Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Because technically a digital clock shouldn't stop, because if the battery stops, the, the display should fade. That's what I was thinking, yeah. So I, I guess the stopping is limited to things that actually have a mechanism. But then again, is nobody actually paying attention? How do you mean? Because they don't consider it to be supernatural, so they don't think of checking if a digital clock stopped and doesn't change. Oh, that's a good point. Because it's a digital I mean, clock. I know in my apartment in uh, Ontario, I, quite often I'll go, I'll walk into my bedroom and the alarm clock will just be bla- flashing and I'll have to reset it. And I, I don't even think about it. It never occurs. To, I just assume the power cut or something. It never occurs to me that there might be something else going on. Yeah. I mean, that's probably why people ignore it. But if you get a digital clock that's stuck on a particular time, then that's something different. Well, you want to uh, take this next, uh, this next little story? I certainly will. In 1997, I was seven years old. My mother had had some terrible stomach problems. And since the doctors and medicine were not helping, a woman, a little old stooped grandmother, came over to help us. 
I was in the kitchen while my mother was lying in the living room, and the woman was setting the medicine up for her. After about forty-five minutes, this woman asked my mother where my room was, because she needed to put something down in there which shouldn't be touched for seven days. I'd made myself a cup of coffee, but when I returned to the room it was gone, so I went into the room, and under my TV shelf I found what looked like a slightly larger metal teacup with a handle, turned upside down, but not the cup I'd lost. A few days had passed and I couldn't stand it, and so before going to sleep that night I picked up the container and see if anything was in it, and it was full of water, but it stayed on the top of it and just didn't come out of the container. Literally, the water stayed in the bottom of the bowl, which is turned upside down. I just put it back down and I couldn't sleep that night, because even for a seven-year-old, that was inexplicable. I think I'll remember about that event as long as I live, and I've still no answer to what or how it happened. And I, there's not much to, to linger on there, but I just think it's uh, just an odd little moment that, again, it was uh, translated from from another language that it just otherwise we wouldn't get a chance to hear. Mm, forest magic. Yeah, and that's it. It sounds like it's sort of yeah the Serbian equivalent of a of a brujo or a bruja or, or something like that. Yeah, very much so. All right, so we have one more story from this trilogy, and then we uh, we're going to move on to our final story. I am Dimitri, and I would like to share my story with you. When I was three or four and sitting between my uncles on a sofa, there were thirty people at a party in the basement and I saw through a small window that an axe was chopping wood in my garden. There was just an axe. No one else, no one holding it. Just one big axe chopping wood by itself. First, how can an axe do that? Second, we were the only people there, or anywhere around. And third, who the hell would chop wood at midnight? <laughs> there is a large forest near the Nishiva, a river near my city, where many men drowned. There are two graveyards from ancient Ottomans, Romans, and even older Slavic people. The wounded and those suffering from infectious diseases died there during both world wars. In the early 1900s, a man murdered two ladies who were washing dishes near the shore. Jews were killed there, and even in older history, there was a story that people saw fairies, which is how my city got its name. My house has been near that forest, just 500 feet away, and we could see it from the window when it was not foggy or raining. The whole area was known as haunted, but full of houses and buildings. Many years later, in 2018, when I was 16, my friend and I decided to walk through the forest, thinking we were safe because there was a key and a promenade along the river where hundreds of people were passing that summer evening. It was eight o'clock, and we were now deep in the woods. We were deep in the forest when we suddenly heard a scream, then a demonic growl, and then from the direction of the bank across the river, we saw red eyes shining. I later graduated from the Faculty of Forestry and am also a hunter. I know every sound in nature in my part of the country, and that sound does not originate from any animal. My side of the shore, where I was, was not as haunted as the one across the river, beyond which stretched that forest into which no one was ever allowed to enter. When we started to run, the road behind us suddenly disappeared and was covered with thick grass, so we ran through bushes and came out completely scratched. When we got out on the boardwalk, my hands were shaking so much that while we were sitting on the bench, my friend had to light a cigarette for me so I could calm down. Following that traumatic experience, I was inspired to begin believing in God. Because of that, I now pray twice a day during the day, and I go to church every week. I mean, that sounds like time slip stuff. There's a bit of everything there. Yeah, no kidding. Um, I got to tell you, man, I'm not, I won't get into it, but uh, the axe thing reminded me of a particularly disturbing story from that Balkan Ghosts book, and I'm going to have to sit with this for a minute here. Bad things were done with an axe to people. We'll just leave it at that. Well, as lovers of horror films, I'm sure we've seen plenty of bad things done to people with axes. True, yeah. The, uh, this was on the level, there was a slasher film that came out earlier this year called uh, In a Violent Nature. Oh, yes. It's a very, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, I, I saw it twice. I don't know that I liked it enough to actually see it twice, but the second time it was playing at a cool theater and I was bored. But um, <laughs> there are some really brutal kills in that movie, like really brutal kills. And I feel like what I read uh, surpassed even, even that. So, uh, yeah, kudos to you, Eastern Europe. I get, no, no, I don't think we should congratulate them for this. No, but I wouldn't be surprised. Why Why wouldn't a ghost use an axe? To the ghost of a woodcutter, he's going to carry on. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe it's a nature spirit. Could be. I just love the idea he's chopping the wood. He's like a wood spirit, and he's looking at the people in the house, being like, this is you. This is you. Look at me. Look at me. I'm the captain now. <laughs> 
stranger things have happened. The Pigeon, a final story for tonight. There was a bad period of about six years where I was very sick. I was in a critical condition for a long time, and my only memories of that period are related to my long recovery in the hospital. There's something I remember well, though. To the hospital window often came a white pigeon with a red thread tied around one leg. During one visit, I told my mother and grandmother about the pigeon, and then my grandmother, otherwise a pious woman, said she tied the thread, and that that pigeon was guarding me now. I believed her, and felt much safer when he was on my window sill. I soon started getting up and feeding him breadcrumbs. Many years later, my mother told me that my grandmother believed that the pigeon was my guardian, and I owed him my life. Nobody even tried to argue this with her, because the love between the elderly and their grandchildren is special and untouchable by anyone outside of it. Many years have passed since then. In the fall of 1994, the war was raging in Bosnia. Although I did not participate it indirectly, I still find myself in a military unit where I was able to train on and use seize radio equipment. I arrived at the military base late at night and was sent in about half a kilometre from the garrison to where the equipment was waiting for me. I got there and set it all up. I was the only person, in addition to a soldier and some officers who were meant to help me at the working station. In the army, you get up early. When my host saw how much effort it took to wake me up, they promised to bring me a very strong coffee. I went out to the courtyard, found a garden table, and whilst waiting for the coffee, tried to understand how and where I found myself. We were at the foot of a mountain, miles away from the city. The morning was fresh and there was still a mist in the air. In wartime, when horror becomes part of everyday life, man can take comfort in the thought that there's something stronger than this human nonsense. The sun still warms, the sky still blue, and the trees still list and bring fruit. Behind a low fence was a field with several plum trees. They looked ripe and ready to harvest, but the plocals, but the locals were probably away in a refugee camp, so there was no one there to pick them. I couldn't remember the last time I'd eaten some plums, and I felt a great desire to pick them and share them with my comrades. I took a few steps and stopped, as a white pigeon flew above my head and landed on the fence in front of me. I couldn't believe my eyes. A red thread was tied around his leg. I was as confused as never before. I wanted to show someone, but I was alone in the yard. I looked at him for a long time, unsure of what to do. He turned his head and looked at me in one and then the other eye, as if he was trying to tell me something. I approached him gingerly, step by step, trying not to frighten him. When I arrived close enough that I could touch it, the door behind my back opened and the officer shouted, Don't go over the fence! It's a minefield! If it wasn't for that pigeon, I would have charged straight over into that minefield trying to get at those plums. That bird really did protect me. I wonder what the symbolism of the red thread is. I was wondering that myself. Um, and again, this this was another one that came from... Uh uh google translate so hopefully it's a red thread you know i, I don't know what i mean i have no idea what else it could be but that that was what it what it spit out hmm. i i sort of wondered if maybe like she had tied it around if someone had tied it around the the, the leg or or you know maybe it's a serbian thing if you if you chase down a pigeon and tie a red thread it works for you or maybe it's a thread soaked in the blood of the grandmother as a kind of binding connection so she can keep an eye on the grandson that sounds as heavy metal as everything else I read about that country, so sure. I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised. People have used birds to um, use as uh, visitors and uh, uh, spies, haven't they? Throughout I history so. and, yeah, and yeah. mythology and folklore, there's plenty of people that use or change into birds. Who knows, it might be have been the grandmother for all we know. I found that really fascinating. I, um, again, because it's, I think because it ties into the wartime stuff, so it's mm. nice to think there is a, a spot of hope amidst all the bloodshed and carnage. Well, it's, it's very poignant, as he says there. Regardless of the chaos that happens, the sun still rises every morning and goes, goes to bed every night. The wind still blows. The sky's still blue. The clouds are in there. Grass grows. Trees bloom. It's just everything else is blowing up. 
I suppose that's humbling in a way and comforting. No matter what you do, the big machine keeps working. All right, folks. Well, this particular big machine is done telling stories for this episode. We hope you've enjoyed The Haunting of Serbia. If you have any stories from that region or you would like to uh, tell us how great our pronunciation of all these Serbian words are, you can shoot us an email. Ghoststoryguys at gmail.com. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to next Talk Spooky where we will we will talk to some folks, again, who have recently worked in Serbia and seem like very cool people. So here's hoping that comes off. Until then, though, we're going to take a break and be right back with our Ghost Force shoutouts. Hey there, listeners. Before you reach for that skip 15 seconds ahead button, I promise you this isn't an ad. We wanted to take a minute to talk to you about mental health. On this show, I've always tried to be as honest and open as possible about my struggles with depression and anxiety, because even though we've come a long way towards acknowledging the very real damage these things can do, there is still way too much lingering stigma about reaching out for help. And when you start to feel like there's no help, it's easy to start feeling like there's no hope. But Paul has joined me today to remind you there is always hope and there's always help. We're not going to try and talk you out of self-harming right now because we know that's not how it works. Instead, what we wanted to do was tell you something now and hope that should things get bad, you'll remember it and make a phone call or send a text message before you make any permanent decisions. As someone who knows all too well just how important mental health can be. It's never too late to reach out. In Canada, the number to call is 133-456-4566. In the USA, the new number to call is 988. That's 988. In the UK, the number to call is 116123. Or text SHOUT. That's S-H-O-U-T. To 85258. In Australia, the number to call is 131114. However bad shit seems, it will pass. And no matter what your brain might be telling you at any given moment, and believe me when I say I know this intimately, there are people who love you and people who care deeply about how you treat yourself. Should a time come when you find yourself despairing, Please know that we've both been where you are, and there is a way back to the world. Take care. Welcome back. The ghost story guys are Luke Greensmith, who helps us find our stories. He's also host of the Luke Lore podcast, available everywhere. Find podcasts live. Rody Daniels, who helped find the stories for this episode. Sarah Kent, who manages our Reddit community. Tanya Downing, who manages our Facebook community. She's also co-host of the Streaming Into Madness podcast with Walter Whitaker. Our paranormal conductor is Mr. Brennan Storr. And of course, my friend, my co-host, the one, the only, the inimitable, Paul Bestel, the paranormal Johnny Carson himself, host of Mysteries and Monsters. Paul, what's coming up on Eminem? I'm looking into one of the greatest unsolved crimes of the 20th century in North America. Who as keeps I giving Woody Allen money to make movies? <laughs> Not quite. Okay. Just who Please was D.B. Cooper? Will we ever know? Ooh. Can we ever know? And why has one particular suspect never appeared in the FBI files, despite having over a hundred people tell them he was D.B. Cooper? Woody Allen. <laughs> <laughs> Joss Whedon. <laughs> well, if there's anyone we want to throw out of a plane. <laughs> it's that shit out. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I'm delighted to welcome Drew Beeson back as we dive into... Some of the characters and uh, one of the stranger suspects who was actually a mass murderer who people suspected of being D.B. Cooper, who wasn't, who was another one of those wonderful criminals who was caught by someone randomly watching television. On, I think it was Unsolved Mysteries. I went, I know him. I didn't realize he'd murdered every member of his family and run away. Holy shit. Um, so not as, not as good as Whitey Bulger being caught by a, a, a dog lover from Finland, but it's up there. <laughs> Oh, I cannot wait to hear that, man. I cannot wait. 
Where can everyone find you online? You can find Mysteries and Monsters across social media platforms and all podcast sites. Fabulous. I'm Largely the Truth on Instagram, Threads, Blue Sky, and Letterboxd. And Paul has inspired me to be more active on Threads, as he is also on there more now. Uh, and wherever Paul is, is the cooler place to be. So uh, again, you find me most active on Threads, <laughs> but I'll be at all those other places as well. <laughs> yes. That's why Hull's going to be really cool this weekend. Oh, of course. Yeah. You, it two days now is your birthday. Yeah. Yeah. Two days till I meet Whitley Streber. Fantastic. Oh, I can't wait to see the news reports. Bald man <laughs> licks Whitley Streber. A giant craft appears in the skies. Oh, I was just thinking you just jump him, but no, that too. <laughs> Only to hug him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You can hug him, you lick his cheeks. Sign oh, my book. <laughs> you son of a... I don't know why. It's always violent with me. I don't know why. Especially with people I like. Sign my ah. book or I keep the hat. <laughs> As we said at the top of the show, we can only do this because of our subscribers, folks on Apple Podcasts, Patreon, and YouTube. And what those folks get, you get bonus shows, ad-free feeds, the monthly live show that Paul and I do. You also get spooky articles read by me. I just did one about haunting in Utah. Mm. It's from an ape. Yeah, it's from like a 1959 edition of a periodical that uh, our listener Maddie sent in. A really fascinating stuff. Some of it, it, it I, if you listen to the bonus content, you get to hear me kind of mentally just fall apart as it goes on because it starts <laughs> saying increasingly outlandish shit. But <laughs> the first half of it is is really good. <laughs> and you get all of that by signing up via the link in the show notes right at the very top of the window. You'll see a link there. Or by heading to patreon.com slash ghoststoryguys. That's patreon.com slash ghoststoryguys. Or by signing up to Ghost Story Guys Premium on Apple Podcasts and YouTube. And of course, if you're a patron of this show at the $20 level and above, well, my friends, that puts you in an elite club. That makes you part of a little something we like to call Ghost Force. <laughs> Paul, I feel like it's really important to mention that after this episode, Ghost Force is not actually a private army. It sounds a little bit like that. Yes. But I feel like no war crimes have been committed. Spiritual soldiers. Not loving that. Not loving that. Jim Jones would be proud. It's getting worse. <laughs> Drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> the members of Ghost Force are... Ethan Saragon. Bryn wears a pink tutu. Cackling Skull. Crazy Mom. City. Flowey Two Hats. Gabrielle Hollanders. Hannah Brown. Hannah Seamus. Hillary Dissasur. Jade Moores. Danny Bonanani. <laughs> Jenny Bonanani. <laughs> Jenny Bonanani. Jason R. Slaughter. Slaughter, 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 Slaughter. Jennifer Mullen. Joseph Como. Kissing Kate Barlow. Oh, that's, that's the worst sound. And you think it's my mouth. <laughs> Malevolent oh. Clamano. Malevolent Clamano. Maranor. Oh. <laughs> Come on, focus. Where are we again? Maranoriega, your turn. Maranoriega. <laughs> Mark Semler. Megan Rocket. <laughs> Merlin Hansen. Nicola. Peter Gunn, 08.5. Rebecca Brink. Robin Tien. Rockin' Ruddy Shenanigans. Scrapbot, 13. Shannon Steyer. Trent Cannon. You are the few. You are the spooky. You are Ghost Force. <laughs> <laughs> For real, guys. Thank you so, so, so much. Again, we love and value all of our subscribers, but Ghost Force, you guys are especially crazy and we really love you for it. And if you want to have your name run out in that absolutely and increasingly unhinged segment, <laughs> you sign up to Patreon via the link in our show notes and sign up for the Ghost Force tier. Uh, Ghost Force is also available. On, oh boy. Well, I, I, I mean, if you're going to put Okay, yeah, that's put kissing in your name. Like I always say, we'll say whatever you put in your username. So I brought this on myself. <laughs> Story of my life, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. The Patreon, um, you can sign up to Ghost Force via YouTube as well. Uh, just not Apple Podcasts. They don't have a, a tiered system as yet. 
If you want to pick up some Ghost Story Guys merch, head to our website at ghoststoryguys.com. We have all kinds of cool stuff, including t-shirt versions of the episode covers. So not for all of them, but for some of them, including The Haunting of Serbia, you will see uh, stickers and t-shirts of our cover designs. And again, that's at ghoststoryguys.com. Paul, do you have any guest spots coming up? Uh, Not at the moment. Oh, actually, no, I'll tell a lie. I've got some exciting news. Oh, do tell. Uh, I will be speaking at Paramit in September 2025, uh, which is being held in Hinkley. I've been invited back, so I can't have done that badly. And so I will be (laughs) appearing at the second Paramit of next year. Um, Details to follow. Amazing. And your first uh, Paramit uh, talk is now up on your YouTube channel, is it not? Yeah, uh, it's it's on Patreon. Okay. I, I haven't got around to sticking it on YouTube just yet, but it's available for, for patrons uh, from last year, which you very kindly edited down for me. And, oh, sure, uh, yeah. And so I will be hopeful that my laptop doesn't die during my performance this year, next year. <laughs> I forgot about that. That was... Jeff, oh, what a, that bloody yeah. mongoose. It was Jeff and the ridiculous temperatures in that conference hall. Because <laughs> I was that. sweating. I f- felt so bad for the listener sitting next to me. <laughs> Brutal. I'm just, I hope you still listen to the show. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, yes, more details to follow because I'm not sure which day I'm speaking on. I just hope I'm not on last. Here's hoping. All right. And I was recently a guest on the Ghost Furnace podcast. You'll find that via the link in our blog at ghoststoryguys.com. If you get a chance, uh, rate and review us on any platform that'll let you, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, uh, all those good places, helps bump the numbers, helps uh, increase engagement, puts a show in front of more people. And if you want to be heard on Talk Spooky, you can now comment on Spotify in a more comprehensive way. So if you want to leave a comment there, we will try and get your comments into the next Talk Spooky. It won't be this one coming up because, again, we hopefully have some guests uh, scheduled. But, again, we always try to get as many comments, emails, and stories as we can into those Talk Spooky episodes. Our theme song, Radio, Into the Darkness We Go, is composed and performed by Peter Kursov of Pizzanta Music. Find more from him by searching for Pizzanta Music wherever you get your tunes. And I guess that's going to do it. We'll be back next week, but until then... Into the Darkness We Go. Let's try this again. (laughs) What is going on? Bloody work, chuffing thing. Right, I'm here now. I can see you again. Oh, that's what it is. Hey, I figured out a human thing. (laughs) This film brought to you by cocaine. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So is it smart ass? Irritating, is it? <laughs> I, I, I actually I, I do owe you an apology for not muting my microphone when I was trying to fix it the other day. I didn't realize how fucking annoying that was. Uh, yeah, because I was editing and I'm like, oh, that poor fucker had to hear this. Oh god. <laughs> I've heard worse. Well, not I, I, I'll try harder. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to try and watch that. It looks looks nearly as balmy as Yakuza Apocalypse. And that's saying something. It fucking is. <laughs> One of them films where I had to look at my spliff and go, hang on, it's got crack in it. <laughs> what the fuck is going on in this film? Why is there a frog riding a bike? What's happening? I didn't read it, but I appreciate you taking the time. <laughs> <laughs>